Hey everybody, it's Jason and we are going to get started with our live stream here in the Dion Training Facebook group. Uh, I wanted to say thank you all for coming out today and as we go through I'm going to answer your questions live and I'll take any questions you have so feel free to post them in the Q&A or excuse me in the, in the questions and uh, reactions area and we'll drag them on here onto the screen and we'll answer those questions for you. So the uh, first one I wanted to bring up was one that we got last night which was... See if it'll let me bring this up. Aha, there we go. Awesome. So this one came in from Matt, and he wanted to know what is the best career path, in my opinion, and how you'd search for that type of a job, and what kind of certs do you need? Um, so best is kind of hard to quantify, right? Because everyone is best at different things. Uh, I'll tell you what I really enjoy, and I really enjoy the cybersecurity world. Um, now, I know that's really big and broad, right? There's lots of different things inside that. There's the IT service management, which is where you're doing things like help desk and system administration, and you're doing network administration and, and other things of that nature, right? That's kind of the IT operations side. And then all the way on the other side, we have the cybersecurity and information security world, which is kind of the guys who do the policy and the policing and your network operations center and your security operations center, your incident response and malware analysis and pen testing and all of that kind of fun stuff, right? And so there's this big long continuum that goes on from where you start to where you may end up one day. Um, and then there's kind of this offshoot, I guess I'd put it up here, uh, not that it's higher, but it's just got to be not on that whole pipeline. And that's the project management side of things, right? The people who have to buy, install, and, and get all this stuff working. And project management could be tied into information security roles, or it could be tied into IT operations roles. So it could be one or the other. So what is the best career path? Um, I, I think if you go into it knowing that it's going to be a long continuum, right? Um, most people don't start out right in cybersecurity. Um, it, it's one of the, the big misnomers that I see in the industry right now. A lot of people are like, I want to be in cybersecurity. And I see colleges going, come get your bachelor's of cybersecurity and we're going to help you get a job. Uh, and it's not panning out the way that people are thinking. And the reason why is because employers are looking for people who have experience prior to hiring them. And how do you get experience if no one will hire you? Well, that becomes another problem. But anyway, I digress as I go in circles. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting flagged down by my assistant over here. <laughs> um, so yeah, so when you look at that, I think if you want to be in cybersecurity, which honestly I do think is the best career path, um, you have to be able to break into that. And to break into that, you need experience. And the way you get experience is to work in the IT operation side first. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is you're going to learn awesome customer service skills by working in the IT operation side first. That means things like the dreaded service desk that nobody ever seems to want to work in. But that's a great way to get your foot in the door. And then you can work your way up into system administration or network administration. And once you do those two things for a couple of years, say one, two, three years, you've got the experience on your resume to help you break into the cybersecurity side. Because I'll tell you, having worked in the cybersecurity side and having started in IT operations 20 years ago, been doing this for a while, I'm getting old, um, having that background in IT operations has been crucial to my success inside the cybersecurity world. Um, the good thing about cyber, the cybersecurity world is there is a ton of jobs available for the right people. That means people with experience, and then they look for certifications, and then they look for degrees. Those are the three things they're looking for. In that order, experience is number one, certifications is number two, and degrees is number three. Now, some people will tell you, you don't need degrees or you don't need certifications. Um, I will tell you that those are people who have been in this industry for a long time. And they're a little jaded because they came up like I did, where those things weren't nearly as important as they are today. These days, those things are becoming more and more important. Um, but you can have the degree and no experience and you're not going to get the job. You can have experience and no degree and you might get the job. Um, but the best, most suitable candidates are the ones who have some experience, usually two to three years before they make the transition to cybersecurity uh, from the IT operations side. They usually have some certifications, usually something like Security Plus is the gateway in, that's kind of the first one, and then something like a CYSA Plus, Cybersecurity Analyst Plus, or um, uh, Cisco CyberOps. Those two are kind of on the same playing field. Um, and then the degree is, you're going to get to a certain level where it's going to be expected you get a degree. So you can get into the field without the degree, but at some point you're going to have to get that degree if you want to move up. Um, you're going to hit a certain cap and then you're going to kind of stop if you don't have at least a bachelor's degree. 
So that's kind of um, a long way to say what's the best career path. It depends on you. Um, I, I think kind of the tried and true career path is you start in the operations side. You do that for two or three years. So service desk, network administration, or server administration, one of those two. And then you move over to cybersecurity as an analyst doing um, the, the network operations center or the SOC analyst, the security operations center. And from there, you're able to move yourself up into higher level jobs with larger responsibilities, bigger budgets, bigger people. And of course, that means your paycheck continues to go up as you keep increasing up this ladder. Um, so that's, that's what I would say for there. What jobs are you looking for? Um, the titles when you're first starting out is going to be something like service desk, help desk, uh, service desk analyst. Those are usually the first ones, and that's going to be where you're going to get your entry level stuff. Um, those don't pay amazingly. I mean, they're, they're usually $20 an hour or something of that nature. And to get those jobs, they're looking at something like an A+, a Network+, plus, a Security+, plus, or a Microsoft certification, depending on what you're going to be the service desk of. So if you're going to be doing uh, Windows 10 help desk, they may want you to have a Windows 10 certification, that kind of a thing. Um, the next level would be your network administration or your server administration. And for those, you're looking for something like a CCNA, Cisco Cyber, uh, excuse me, Cisco Certified Network Administrator, Administrator, I can't talk today. Cisco Certified Network Administrator, CCNA, is usually the big one for the network side. And then on the, on the server side, you'd be looking at something like a Microsoft uh, Systems Administrator, something like Windows 2016 Server. And then when you go to break into cybersecurity, they're looking for Security Plus, CYSA, or CyberOps. Those are kind of the, the, the gateway as you progress over. Um, what will help you excel quickly in those roles? Um, the soft skills, actually. It's being able to talk to people, being personable, um, having the knowledge is important. Um, but people want to work with people they enjoy working with, right? So it's those people who are um, nice, friendly, um, it's the people you want to hang out with at work, right? I mean, you're going to be spending 40 hours a week with these people. You want to be with people you like. Uh, and so a lot of times in the job interview, they're looking for that too. You could be the most skilled person, but if you're hard to talk to and hard to work with, I won't hire you, right? Um, or the employer won't hire you, right? Because we want to be with people we like. So uh, that, that was kind of a long way to answer your question, but hopefully that helps. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, I'm just searching through the comments. Give me one second. Ah, here's another good question. I love this one. Um, this was a question I got earlier as well prior to the live stream, which is, what is better? Um, there's a lot of certifications about security, technology, system operations, IT service management, uh, all sorts of different ones, right? Including project management. And if you look at the courses I teach, I teach all of those, right? I teach ITIL, which is service management. I teach PRINCE2, which is project management. I teach Network Plus. I teach CYSA Plus, which is Security and Analyst. I teach Pentest Plus. I teach CASP. Uh, I've got Wi-Fi hacking. I'm, I, all these different things all across the spectrum. Um, should you be jumping and getting certifications all over the place? Um, I would say to start with, no. Um, you want to focus your studies into a particular area because there is a lot of power to focus. Um, I would recommend you don't go out and get every certification out there. There is a ton of certifications. And if you look at my resume uh, or my profile on, on Udemy or something like that, you'll see that I've got 10 or 15 different certifications listed. Um, I will tell you, a lot of those I got in the last couple of years. And the reason why was because I was teaching for colleges and to teach the certification, you had to have the certification. Um, up until that point in the, in the world that I was working in, in you know, doing this, doing cybersecurity on a daily basis and IT operations on a daily basis. The ones they wanted me to have, there was four, okay? Um, IT, uh, uh, ITIL was one I was required to get by my employer because we used ITIL in our organization, as do much of the world. It's kind of the baseline for IT service management. And so they wanted everyone to have at least ITIL foundations because that way we're all speaking the same language and we understand the same processes. The next one was Security Plus. Everyone had to have Security Plus in my organization that I was working at. It was a requirement. If you were going to be a system administrator or manage system administrators, you had to have Security Plus. So that was the second one. The third one I got was CISSP. In our organization, once you reached a certain level, when you became a higher level manager or a higher level engineer, you had to have CISSP, Certified Information System Security Professional. That one requires you pass an exam and have five years of documented experience. 
So if you just started in this industry, you can't get that one yet, but that's okay. Um, so that was the third one that was required. And that was usually once you got into the higher level management, usually these are people who already had a bachelor's degree or master's degree, and then they had to get their CISP. The last one you needed was the fourth one, uh, was if you started working on the incident response side or you started working in the SOC or the NOC side, uh, the, the security operations center or the network operations center. And for that, you needed to get a certified ethical hacker. Um, that requirement is now changing um, and they are making it a little bit more broad. You can get CYSA plus, you can get CEH, or you can get Pentest Plus. Any of those three will work. That one was in the Oh, thing. okay. I'm sorry. She was there. passing me another question to answer next. I got distracted. Uh, but yeah, so those are the four that I, I had up until about three or four years ago when I started teaching, um, well, maybe about five years ago when I started teaching full-time. And when I started teaching full-time, I then had to go back and get a bunch of other certifications because if you were going to teach it, you had to have it. Um, now... As far as when you're in the workplace world, you know, should you get a bunch of these different certifications? I would tell you, you don't want to go out and get a bunch of different certifications from a bunch of different companies. Um, the reason why is twofold. One, it's expensive. Um, certifications aren't baseball cards. We don't want to just collect them just to collect them. Um, each one has a large exam fee to take. Um, as you guys have noticed, I mean, if you go take ITIL, it's $350 to sit for the exam. If you take one of the CompTIA ones, it's $320 or $346. If you take CEH, they're charging $1,200 now just to go take their exam, right? Uh, CISSP, $600. These things get really expensive. And so if you start looking at my resume, you start counting up all those certifications and what that costs, it's probably five dollars to $10,000 worth of exam fees just to get those certifications. Um, you don't need that to get a job. Many times your employer will pay for your certifications um, once you get in the door as continuing education. So that's something you can do as well to keep the cost down. Um, the second reason why I wouldn't get a bunch of certifications is I could tell you when I've been on hiring boards and we've gotten the resumes in and I'm sitting there listening to other hiring managers talking and they'll go, oh, look at this guy. He's got 25 different certifications. That tells me he's never been to work in his life because he's too busy studying and taking tests. <laughs> so there is a point <clears throat> of diminishing returns where you just have so many. Um, I had one candidate who had 46 different certifications. Now, they got those certifications over about a 10-year period, but still, if you look at that, that's four to five certifications a year. That's pretty much every two months they went and took another test. Um, that's a lot of continuing to study. There is goodness in continuing to study and getting certifications and moving up your ladder. Um, but when you start getting every certification out there, that becomes a problem. It can be a signal to employers that you don't know what you're doing, you only know how to take tests. So you have to kind of balance that. Um, now going back to this direct question, should you stay in a particular line or should you broaden yourself? Um, it depends on where you want to go. I always think about starting with the end in mind. If I want to be a project manager for IT security stuff, right? I want to be the guy who helps design and build new security operation centers. Then there's a couple of things I probably need to know. I probably need to have ITIL under my belt because incident response, and those type of things are all being run out of the SOC and the NOC. And so I need to understand how they operate so I can help build it better. Um, project management, either a PMP or a PRINCE2 is going to be important in that world. Because if you're going to be given millions of dollars to build something, they want to know that you can go through the procedural rigor, uh, the, the methodology to make sure it gets done properly and on time. So those are two that are important. And then if you're being hired as some expert in security, you probably should have something that says you're an expert in security. And so in that case, if I paired that up with like a CISSP, those three things together would be the ones you need. And those are all in three very different categories, right? It's CISSP from security, project management, PMP or PRINCE2, and ITIL for IT service management. Um, so it's okay to get some of these from different areas. But when you're starting out, I would pick a path and go with it. So I like CompTIA, they have that roadmap, right? You go A plus to Net plus to Security plus, and you kind of work your way up the chain. Um, that gives you a nice dedicated way of going. Uh, the nice thing about doing that as well is, I talked about these, these things cost a lot of money to get the, the, the certifications. They also cost a lot of money to keep your certifications because every three years you have to renew them. And so if you have one with EC Council, CEH, right? And you have one with IC Squared, CISP, and you have one with uh, CompTIA, Security Plus, or CYSA, or Pentest Plus, that's three different companies. And so to renew them, I have to pay three different fees. 
it's $100 a year over here, it's another 85 over here, another 50 over here. And so if you're one of those people who has 20 or 30 different certifications across Cisco and Amazon and, and um, Microsoft and all these different companies, you might be paying a couple hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars a year just in recertification fees. So I try to keep things in the same company as much as possible. So I have pretty much everything CompTIA has put out, but it's all one recertification fee because once you're certified as the highest level, it recertifies all the other ones. Um, I keep my CEH because a lot of employers like that still. I think in two years that's going to go away. Um, not go away, but it's going to decrease. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, and I always keep my CISSP because that's highly valued in the marketplace, right? And so I, I try to minimize the number of, of arms. So I get a lot of questions from students saying, hey, are you going to do Cisco CCNA CyberOps? Or are you going to do Cisco CCNA? Or are you going to do Microsoft or Amazon? And it's one of the things that I haven't expanded into yet because then I have to go get those certifications and maintain them. And that's more tests I have to take, more fees I have to pay, and more annual fees I have to do. Um, and there's only so much I as one guy can do, right? Um, and so we're, we're trying to bring on other instructors who have those skill sets um, to expand our catalog. But me personally, um, I, I try to minimize the different vendors that we, we work with uh, for that reason, because there is just a lot of continuing costs. Uh, let's see what we got here. Um, next question. Ah, here we go. Um, I'll bring this one up. Uh, hey, Jason, what do you think about CCSK cloud certification? I'm a cybersecurity consultant in Europe, and the requirements in the market are not the same as the U.S. Uh, do I have any recommendations? So uh, CCSK cloud certification is one that is, um, cloud is big right now, right? Cloud security is big. Um, the two big ones out there right now is the CCSK and then IC Squared's um, Certified Cloud Service Provider, CCSP, I think it is. Um, and those are the, the two big ones. I'm not as familiar in the Europe market, so I can't answer, a, I can't give you a good answer on which of those two is more popular in your area. Um, but one of the things I would say is that if you check the, um, check the local market and you look at things like Monster or Dice, uh, the job posting websites or whatever that is in, in your particular area, uh, I would look at those and see what is coming up as a key term that they're looking for. Are they looking for CCSP or are they looking for the CCSK? And whichever of those that they're looking for, that's the one I would go for. Um, I've done the same thing here in the U.S. when I looked at overall what cybersecurity certs are most sought after. And CISSP is still the one that most people are looking for. If you look at CISM, CISM, or CISSP, um, they're both fairly equivalent certifications. CISSP is a little bit more challenge, um, but employers ask for that over CISM probably three to one. Um, and so that's why I recommend CISSP over CISM. Um, but again, it depends on your marketplace and where you are. So, so that's one I would look at in your, in your own market. Uh, let's see what else we have here. All right. Um, I should have brought cookies. <laughs> it's secure cookies. Okay. <laughs> you guys are funny. Uh, let's see. Ah, here we go. Here's a good, good question. I like that one. Um, I'm studying for security plus and currently, and trying to structure the studies. Several different videos from several different instructors and several different test banks. Any recommendations on which ones are the best, right? I think that's kind of what you're asking. Um, so here's one of those things where it comes down to focus, right? Um, there is so much noise in the certification marketplace that you could go out and if you search, for instance, um, Security Plus, right? There is probably 10 or 15 different textbooks, including Daryl Gibson's, the Pearson IT one right behind my head right there. You could uh, let's see, right there. Oh, there we go. Uh, there's some Security Plus textbooks right there. Um, <laughs> there's the all-in-one textbooks. There's the total seminar ones that Mike Myers puts out. Um, there's lots of great contents just from the textbook side. And then you get into the video world. And if you just go on Udemy and search for Security Plus, you'll find 10 or 15 different courses um, in addition to IT Pro and Linda and everybody else out there. And then you go to Test Banks, and there's a bunch of those, right? How do you know which one's the best one? Um, what I like to do uh, when I'm looking for a certification is I look for other people's recommendations. So uh, for me, uh, Security Plus, the ones that I've personally used and like, um, I like the Pearson IT books. Um, I, you can kind of see them right on the shelf behind me. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them right here, uh, going all the way from A Plus all the way over to Security Plus. Uh, I do have some Cybex books here, like the CYSA from Mike Chapel, which I think is a good one. 
Uh, but when we're talking about Security Plus, I, I do really like uh, the Pearson IT books. I think they're really good. I think they do a really good job. And I actually like the deluxe edition ones. They're a little bit more expensive, but they come with a DVD in them. And in that DVD is a couple of hundred extra practice questions, as well as some like lab type things that you can go through and do some simulations and get some practice. So I think those are good. Uh, from a video perspective, um, right now the one I usually recommend is Mike Myers over on Udemy um, or on his website, totalseminars.com. Um, the funny thing is you can go to his website and they're $50 or $100 for the videos. You can go to Udemy and today they're still running their $9.99 sale um, because they're, they're doing the end of the month back to school sale. Um, so all the courses are $9.99. So you can go there and pick up an entire Security Plus video that's like 15 hours long uh, for $9.99. As far as practice exams, uh, Mike Myers, I think, has some really good practice exams as well. Uh, again, he has one on Udemy that's got five or six full-length exams for $9.99, which, again, is a really good deal considering you're going to spend $320 on the certification exam. Um, I, I'm a big fan of, of practice exams, taking a lot of them, uh, and also from different people. So if you're going to buy Mike's videos and his practice exams, I would get practice exams from somebody else as well. So uh, you, you already have a bunch of videos from different instructors and test banks. Um, for me, the way I tend to study, uh, and this really works well, and I would recommend it for most of you guys as well, uh, when you start out, find a practice exam and take one. So if I'm thinking, you know what, I want to go take Security Plus, this is my next certification, I will go buy a practice exam like Mike Myers's. Mike Myers, I hate names that end with an S, it makes it hard. Uh, Mike Myers's practice exams, the practice exams by Mike Myers, uh, <laughs> I would get those and I would take that first and I would see how I did. And maybe without even studying, without even watching a video, maybe I got 50%. Well, you only need 75% to pass the exam, so you're like almost there, right? Then I would go and find the videos or the books, whichever way you learn best. For me, I tend to learn from books which I know is really weird considering I'm a video instructor, but I actually like learning from books better. <laughs> um, and, and so I would get a book and I would skim the book. I'm not even reading it all, right? I'm kind of going, I know this, I don't know this. And I'll, I'll figure out what I need to study from that. And I'll study the parts that I really don't know. So in Security Plus, I'm really good with the CIA triad maybe, but I really suck at IP security and VPNs. I'm just making it up, right? So let's say that that's what it is. Um, I would go ahead and I would, I would study that part. Then I would go back and take another practice exam and see how I did. I bet you I went from 50 to 70 or 80, right? And if I'm getting, you know, in the 80% consistently, that's good enough to go take the exam and pass. So that, that works for me. Um, so that, that's kind of usually how I study is I, I'm, a, I'm a very, I'm very big on figuring out what I know to figure out what I don't know, where I need to work on, and then go take the next thing. Um, I'll, I'll give you a great example of this. Uh, you guys know I have the ITIL course, right? I, I teach ITIL at the foundation level. Well, I wanted to go and get the practitioner level because I had a lot of students who've been asking me to create that course. So what I did was I went and I got the ITIL practitioner book, which looks like, well, this is the, uh, the Prince one. Um, so we'll talk about the Prince practitioner because I did the exact same thing for that one. Um, this is the Prince practitioner guide. Very, very thick, very, very long. Um, couple, 400 pages or so of material. Very big, very dense, right? Um, I didn't want to have to read all of this and memorize it for the practitioner exam. So instead, I went and took the practice exam, saw how I did. Um, I ended up getting a 80% without even opening the book yet. Um, so I looked at the ones I missed, I looked at the book for those, and then I went and took the exam and passed it. It took me about two days. Um, I'm not saying this to brag, I'm just saying this is how my method works, right? Take a practice exam, see where you are, and then you can go from there to study up what you need to. Um, and when I took the real exam, you know, blew it away, no problems, right? Um, same thing with ITL practitioner. Um, I got the book, and within three days, I went and took the exam and, and passed it. Um, so it, it's it's things like that that as you start building your base, you're going to be able to do that. Um, going back to your initial question, is there certain videos that I like better than others? Um, I like Mike. I think he uh, Mike Myers does a really good job of being entertaining, um, which I try to do in my videos as well. Um, some other instructors, I feel like they're reading a book to me, and that puts me to sleep, so I can't deal with them that. I like people who are energetic and Mike is that way. So um, for videos, I really do like Mike Myers's, Mike Myers's videos. Uh, and if you get them on, U on Udemy, they're $9.99. Uh, another great one out there is Professor Messer. A lot of people like Messer. Um, I found his personality a little bit, um, it's not my style. So I don't personally like watching it, but I've had a lot of students who swear by Professor Messer's materials. His knowledge is great. His materials are great. And he's been doing this great. The great thing about his stuff is it's all free. 
Uh, he gives all his videos uh, for A+, Net+, and Security+, Plus free on his site, ProfessorMesser.com. Um, definitely check it out. James Messer does a great job. Um, I just personally don't like the style. doesn't match me, um, but Mike is, is more my style. So um, but that's, that's the great thing about being that there are tons of different instructors out there is that everyone has their own style and they all like their own stuff, right? Uh, and so you can find somebody that really matches your style and how you learn. So there, there's that. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, is one to two certs a year reasonable for busy people? Yes, um, it definitely is. Um, but again, you don't need to get one to two certs a year unless that's part of your plan to get where you want to go. If you want to be somebody who's running a SOC, then you know you need these five certs over the next three years. You can plan that out and do that, right? But don't just go get certs just to get certs. Um, the other recommendation I would have is once you get your Security Plus, right, uh, in three years, you're going to have to renew it. Don't go take the Security Plus again. Go take the next higher level. If you go get CYSA or Pentest Plus, that renews your Security Plus for another three years. And so you can move up the ladder in the same company that keeps all your other certs uh, renewed and get you another cert. Um, so that is, that is a good plan. Same thing with Cisco. If you have a CCNA, you then move up to CCNP, and then you move to CCIE. And as you move up that chain, all of your, your, your lower certs are all renewed as well. Um, <laughs> thanks, heavens. I don't read to you guys. Yeah, uh, you don't want me reading to you, and I don't want to read to you, so I don't do that. I try to be very conversational. I think it connects better uh, with our students, and they learn better from it. Um, yeah, different personalities for different people, right? you got to find what works for you. Totally agree. Um, so yeah, so that was, that, that's, let's see, I don't see, all right, I think I got all the questions you guys asked, so please type them in the comments if you have more. I'm going to bring out a couple of other things while I'm waiting for you guys to come up with some more questions um, that I've been getting asked very frequently uh, in my Q&A in the courses, as well as by direct message. Uh, one of them is Pentest Plus versus CEH. Um, this is kind of the big thing right now. For those of you guys who don't know, uh, Pentest Plus was just released by CompTIA back in July, uh, July 31st of 2018. So why was Pentest Plus brought into the marketplace? Because there was already CEH. Um, there's a couple of things that, C that Pentest Plus does that CEH doesn't. Uh, for one, CEH has been raising the price consistently year after year. I first got my CEH because my employer told me to back in 2009 and it cost me $500. Uh, then they raised it to 600. About two years ago, they raised it to 1,000. Uh, just uh, just August 15th, so about two weeks ago, they raised the price again. It is now $1,200 to take the CEH exam. Um, a lot of employers went to CompTIA as a nonprofit organization, uh, including the U.S. government, Intel, Microsoft, IBM. They have hundreds of different partners, and they said, "Hey, we need something that tests people's ability to do pen testing." We don't think CEH is thorough enough, so that was one issue, and it's getting ridiculously expensive because there's no competition for them. And so CompTIA went and they developed a competition for it called Pentest Plus, which is penetration testing. Um, the cost of that exam is $346, which is 25% the cost of what CEH is charging at $1,200, right? Big cost savings. Uh, but in addition to that, one of the things that CEH was very focused on was attack. With Pentest Plus, they added more of the before and after the assessment, not just the attack portion, but before it, all of the contractual stuff you have to do, all of the rules of engagement and the permission and the planning, they added that to it. They also added on the backside all of the reporting, because after you do a pen test, most of your work is actually reporting it back to the customer so they know how you got in and what they need to fix. And so those two portions were added on in Pentest Plus that really aren't covered much by CEH. The other thing that they really added on was the programming scope. So as a pen tester, you have to be able to read and understand programs. And so they talked about you need to understand PowerShell, Ruby, Bash, and Python. And those four things are covered in the Pentest Plus exam. They are not covered in CEH. So when I look at Pentest Plus versus CEH, I find that Pentest Plus is more thorough it is a deeper coverage. It is harder than CEH. I'll be honest here, but I think it's a better certification. Um, when I took that exam, I thought it was really, really well done. Um, when I took CEH, I was actually very disappointed because it was so easy. Um, the course for CEH is really good that, CE that EC Council puts on, 
but the exam itself is not to the level of the course. The course goes through how to actually do all the hacking and the labs and all that stuff. But then you go take the exam and it's really security plus plus a little bit more. Um, pen test plus is a lot more than just security plus. So I, I really thought that was good. The other thing with um, pen test plus is they do have simulations to prove your knowledge in addition to the multiple choice. CEH is still just 125 questions multiple choice. Now they've added this thing called CEH practical that you could take afterwards as another exam and another six, seven, eight hundred dollars that is fully simulation based. Um, but that hasn't really gained traction in the marketplace yet. So will Pentest Plus dethrone CEH as the go-to pen test certification of choice? Um, don't know yet. Um, it's only been out for three weeks. Yeah, three weeks at this point, four weeks. Um, so we don't know. But I'm willing to bet that within the next 18 to 24 months, you're going to see a lot of employers asking for Pentest Plus either at, in um, replacement of CEH or instead of CEH. And what I mean by that is when you look at the job posting, instead of it saying CEH required, they'll say CEH or Pentest Plus required. And I think in the next two to five years, you're going to see that it's just going to be they're looking for Pentest Plus. That's my personal opinion. Um, I'll caveat that with saying I teach Pentest Plus. I sell courses on Pentest Plus. So, um, and the reason why is because I believe in Pentest Plus. Uh, I was actually about 20% of the way through recording a course on CEH and decided to stop and switched my gears and completely went to Pentest Plus because I really believe that is the future and I think CEH is, is going to decline over time. Um, so that, that's my opinion. Um, you know, what the facts are is we'll see that in about a year. Um, based on what happened with CYSA, uh, which was within 12 to 18 months, the DOD and all of its, the Department of Defense here in the U.S. and its contractors have all been seeking out people with C, uh, CYSA+. Plus. It has become very, very popular here in the United States. I think the same thing is going to happen for Pentest+. Plus. So that's kind of why I went that way. Um, so that, that's what I, I that, that was, that's my uh, CEH versus Pentest uh, Plus because I get that question a lot. <laughs> um, all right, so... Uh, if you achieve the top of the ladder with CAST cert, do you need to retake it? So no, you don't have to retake it, but you do have to do uh, continuing education. So all of these certs have renewal fees and they have continuing education requirements. Uh, for Security Plus, for instance, it's I think it's a $50 per year renewal fee and it's a um, 50 hours of continuing education over three years. And you could take them all in one year or you could do a little bit over the three years. But if you take the next level certification, CYSA or pen test, that automatically renews your, C, your, your Security Plus and you don't have to worry about getting the, the credits. But once you get to the top of that CompTIA ladder, which is CASP, how do you renew it? Well, there's two ways you can renew it. The first way is you can retake the exam. So if you pass right now with CASP, the CASP version 3 that's currently out, in three years when you go to renew it, it'll be version four. You just go take version four, and if you pass it, boom, you're CASP certified again. Um, but most of us don't have to go take another exam if we don't have to. So the second way you can do it is by getting continuing education hours. And for CASP, I'd have to look up the chart again. I think it's 75 hours over three years. It's something like that. But it's a $50 per year uh, continuing education fee, uh, renewal fee, so $150 for the three years, and that's 75 hours. How do you get that 75 hours? Uh, some things are done by getting other certifications. That's one option. So, for instance, if you go get your CEH, I think that counts as 50 credit hours towards your CASP renewal. If you get your CISSP, that's like a direct renewal. Um, if you take courses, right, you took one of my courses and it relates to a CASP domain. Uh, for instance, risk management. I have a risk management course that's about two hours long. If you take that course, you get a certificate at the end that says two hours spent. You take that and you submit that to CompTIA, and that's two hours of your 75 that you need. Um, and so you could take multiple small courses like that or one really large course, and that would get your continuing education. So that's your two ways. You either do continuing education hours, and you have to have some documentation for that, usually a, a PDF certificate or a hard copy certificate if you went to an in-person class, um, or you take the exam again. So those are your two options. Uh, let's see... Yeah, so here's a good point. Uh, CYSA has hooked up with IBM Q Radar, and many other vendor collaborations are on the way. Will Pentest have those type of things with offensive uh, vendors? Um, I know CompTIA is looking at partnerships with wherever they can to really push the certification in the marketplace. CYSA, they had made some really good partnerships. 
So IBM has a certification that to get their certification on their software, you have to have CYSA first and then their certification exam. And when you put those two together, you become this IBM QRadar certified person. Um, and other vendor collaborations are on the way. Uh, for Pentest Plus, it is a new cert, and they are working those uh, deals. I don't know if they're going to be able to make a deal with somebody like Tenable or Rapid7. Um, that's still up in the air. Um, I know Rapid7, they're the ones who do Metasploit, um, and they have a couple of deals with um, some other companies already, like um, I believe OWF, um, OSCP uh, works with Rapid7 as well. Um, so I don't know if they have... You know, when you start getting into contracts and exclusivity, they may already have an exclusive deal with them, so they may not be able to do it. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if Pentest starts bundling things together like that. Um, that, would, that would be very much in the, in the realm of the possible. I don't have any insider knowledge on it, except to see that uh, I saw it happen with IBM on the CYSA side, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see it in the future. Um, yeah, so uh, any other questions, feel free to throw them in there. Uh, I'm going to pull another one from my list here. So let's see, I got that one done. Uh, we talked about that. We talked about that. Um, talked about that. Uh, all right. Are you considering any Cisco training in the near future? Ah, am I am I considering Cisco training in the near future? Um, uh, to be honest, not at this time. Um, in the future, maybe. Um, in 2018, no. And 2019, right now, uh, 2019, we're really focusing on finishing up our our CompTIA ladder. Uh, we're focusing on our Excellus product lines, which is ITIL, getting into the higher levels of that with practitioner and the intermediate certifications, because we've had a lot of people from our ITIL side that are, are really looking um, to go that direction. And then we're also finishing up our um, Prince2 line. So we have the Prince2 foundation course right now, which is project management. Uh, we're adding to that the practitioner level and the Agile, uh, the Prince2 Agile for our software development folks. Um, so those are kind of the, the big rocks that we have placed for 2019. Um, for Cisco, there's, you know, I, I look at it and there's already a lot of good people out there doing it. Um, and it's just, it, it's not one that's made our, our cut line yet. Uh, I know we've had a lot of requests for CCNA and CCNA CyberOps uh, from a lot of our students. Um, CCNA CyberOps might be one that we would do, um, if, if we started to get into Cisco, that would be the first one, um, because it is very similar to um, cyber, uh, excuse me, uh, cybersecurity analyst, um, and it does focus in our cybersecurity pipeline. Um, so um, that, that's kind of where I would be. Uh, and then the other thing, honestly, uh, I'll just be honest, uh, you don't want me teaching you routers and switches uh, for CCNA. Uh, <laughs> I can do it, but I'm not real great at it because I've been in management and security for too long. Um, I, you know, I, I, the last time I think I've configured a router myself was probably five years ago. Um, so well, while I could, you know, quickly get myself studied back up and, and teach it, um, I'm probably not the best person to be teaching you CCNA or CCNP or CCIE uh, as I am today. Uh, it would take me a lot more work to get back up to that level. Um, CCNA cyber ops, I could totally do that. Uh, you know, I'm a cyber guy. Um, but the actual routers and switches, it's been a while since I was a network engineer. So um, that, that's why I haven't jumped into the Cisco stuff quite yet. So, yeah. Um, Ah, yeah, another good comment. Um, the other way you can renew your uh, CompTIA certifications is they do have what they call the Cert Master CE, um, where you basically are paying them for some training, and it will automatically renew your certifications as well. And you can do that through CompTIA. Um, I haven't looked at the price on that recently. It used to be a couple hundred bucks, I think. Um, so there's cheaper ways to renew your certs, but that is an easy way to do it. Um, and it's, it's you know, not too, too expensive. It's, it's less than 200, I think. Um, so good comment. Uh, let me see the next one we have for you. Um, ah, I, I saw somebody earlier today in one of the groups talking about there's so many certifications out there and when they are, um, when they're working on one, like say you start working on security plus and you start studying for it and then you get to the routers and switch section on that and you're like, ah, and then you start wanting to start studying for, you know, CCNA or you want to start studying for network plus. Um, do you have trouble focusing on one cert at a time? Um, or one exam at a time. Um, I will tell you that I find that there is extreme power in focus. So I would pick one cert and go for it, finish it, and then go to another one. If you try to study for multiple things at once, your brain starts getting kind of confused um, and you start getting a little um, ADD and you start going 
bouncing back and forth. Um, it'll take you a lot more time to get through two of them at the same time than it will for you to do one and then the other. Um, I guarantee you'll get through both of those faster if you just focus on one at a time. Um, so I would definitely focus. Um, the other thing is, like I said, I would kind of create a plan. You know, map out for yourself. I want to get this one by this date and this one by this date and this one by this date and kind of plan out the next couple of years. Because um, I'll tell you, in cybersecurity and IT, you're constantly going to be studying for something and moving up your ladder um, as you keep going. So, so that's one of the things I would be looking at. Um, yeah, so th that, that is uh, one of the things I, I would definitely look at there is, is focus. Um, I'll tell you from my side, I am a little AD, uh, ADD. I get a little attention deficit. Uh, I have a little bit of attention deficit and I start getting uh, shiny object syndrome, right? Um, and I think part of that is um, I want to please my students, right? And I get a lot of students who will PM me and say, hey, um, are, are you going to make a CCNA class, right? Or are you going to make um, a practitioner class? Or are you going to make a CASP course or whatever? Um, I, a CISSP is one I get people ask me all the time. Um, and I'll be like, yes, I'm going to. And then I start running that way. But I was already in the middle of doing another one. And so it takes me longer to get both of them out. Uh, those of you guys who were, were looking for Security Plus uh, are probably still kicking me for that. Um, I was supposed to get you guys that by the summer. Uh, and then Pentest Plus came out and I jumped that way because um, I, I really do believe in Pentest Plus And there's already a lot of good content for Security Plus. I'm still working on Security Plus, I promise. <laughs> um, right now we're, we're, we're scheduled uh, for late October, so it is coming for those of you guys who are, who are waiting on that one. Um, but but we, uh, it is one of the things that I, I want to help everybody, right? Um, and I sometimes I have to pull myself back in and focus, get one done, then go on to the next one. Um, so if you look at our, 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 our certifications right now, we have Network Plus, we have Pentest, we have CYSA, we have CASP. We're missing Security Plus. It's a hole in our pipeline. Uh, so that is getting filled in by the end of this year. Um, like, uh, right now we're aiming for the end of October. Um, and then we are moving over to ITIL and Prince for a little bit to get those higher level certifications for those students. Um, and that'll be kind of the next six months or so as we keep moving through uh, both of those pipelines to finish out CompTIA, the ITIL, and the, um, the Prince too. And then we'll be looking at what comes after that. So that's kind of where we are right now. So. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate the questions you guys have. I, you know, I love interacting with you guys and being able to do live. Uh, hopefully this time worked out a little bit better for folks. Um, excuse me. Normally when I do these, I, I do them uh, nighttime my time, uh, which I'm on the East Coast of the U.S. So usually I do it at like 8 o'clock. Um, and a lot of people that wanted to join, uh, especially the folks in Europe, um, it was you know, middle of the night where they're sleeping, so they weren't able to join. So hopefully this 11 a.m. one worked a little bit better for some folks. Um, so yeah, we got about uh, five to 10 minutes left. Yes, I am a little ADD, uh, not even just a little. I am a lot ADD. I'm guessing that was my wife who put that in there, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it was. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, security clearance. That is a great, great question. Uh, let's talk about security clearances. I love that question. I'm going to throw it over here. Um, so, security clearances. Um, first, what is a security clearance? This is mostly for my U.S. folks, although it does apply to those in um, England and other countries with your own country. Uh, I'm going to speak to the U.S. because I understand the U.S. process. I don't understand the other country's process. So if you're if you're not a U.S. person, uh, sorry, I can't help you with this one. <laughs> so um, is it hard to get a security clearance? Um, hard, no, um, to get, but to get sponsored, yes. Um, so let me explain how this works. A security clearance is if you're going to get a job working for the U.S. government, uh, the U.S. military, or a contractor who supports one of those. So let's say, for instance, you're going to work do some work for the Air Force, right? Um, you're going to get picked up for a job to go support the Air Force Base in um, Hawaii, right? Great. Everybody's going to move to Hawaii now, right? Uh, so you're going to be in Honolulu over at the Air Force Base there, and you are picked up to be an IT person for them um, as a contractor, let's say. And so you're going to work for Booz Allen Hamilton, who's one of the contractors. Um, they have computers, and they have two different networks. They have an unclassed network that is tied to the Internet, and then they have another network that is for their secret military information, right? And that's not tied to the internet. To access that network, you have to have a security clearance, at least a secret clearance. And then there's another level for top secret information, right? And so um, if you're going to be hired to work on that type of information, then you have to have a clearance. Um, you can't put yourself in for a clearance. It doesn't work that way. 
and a lot of places won't hire you if you don't have a clearance because it's a timely and cost prohibitive process, especially for the smaller contract companies. So in this in the cybersecurity world, we call it punching your ticket when you get your clearance because it really does open up a ton of doors for you. Um, so how does it work to get a clearance? Well, let's say that you uh, applied for a job with you know one of the big contracting companies, General Dynamics, Booz Allen, Hamilton, whatever, right? And they like you, you got the certifications, you got experience working in a non-cleared job at one point. Uh, when you have a security clearance, we call those cleared jobs. Um, and so let's say you worked for Microsoft for a year as a system analyst. And then we decided we're going to hire you for the Air Force job. Um, we would put you in on a probationary hire until your clearance goes through. Your clearance gets submitted to the security agency um, that the U.S. uses to go through those clearances. They're going to run a background check on you to look at things like, do you have a criminal record? Do you have uh, known drug use? Um, have you been arrested? All those kind of normal background checks, just like most employers would. And they're also going to run a credit check on you to see, are you heavily in debt? Because um, heavily in debt is one of those big triggers for security clearances. Because if you're heavily in debt, you're more likely to sell our secret information to somebody for money to get yourself out of debt. That's kind of the thought process. So they look for certain triggers, things like debt, things like, um, you know, troubled relationships. The higher the clearance, the more in depth that they're going to look. So for a secret clearance, it's usually a criminal background check and a financial check. They're going to look at your credit report and your police record, right? If you have decent credit um, and, you know, you, you aren't behind on your bills and you don't have any criminal record, you're probably going to get your clearance, no problem. When you get up to the top secret level or anything above that, they go a little bit more in depth. They might do things like polygraphs. They might do things like interviewing your friends, your family, and your current business associates. And they'll ask them questions like, do you think that uh, Jason is someone who we can trust with government information? That kind of stuff. Um, so the process is not hard, but it's getting put in for it and getting someone to take a chance on you. Because when a contract company has to put in for a clearance for a new person, it costs them money. Um, and the, the ranges I've heard is somewhere between $5,000 and $20,000 to get this clearance process to go through. So they're taking a risk. Not only are they hiring somebody that may or may not work out, but they're sponsoring their clearance, which means they have to pay for it. Um, and, and so that can cost them a lot of money. Um, so that's why it's hard to get. Once you have it, it's good for five years and it renews every five years. And they, every five years they go through the process. If you already have it, it it's fairly easy to renew. Um, and if you already have it, it's easier to get into other jobs because a lot of jobs will give preference to folks who already have a clearance. And so sometimes I've seen this where a contract company might hire somebody who isn't nearly as technically adept as this other guy. I'll look at two people and this guy's got all the certifications and the degrees and all that good stuff. And then we got this guy who just got out of the military and has a valid clearance and maybe has a security plus and they'll hire him because the thought is I can train him up for less than it's gonna cost me to get this guy his clearance. So that is the challenge. Um, some creative things I've seen people do to overcome this barrier. Um, I've seen people take jobs as janitors for the government buildings because they get their clearance that way. So for instance, if you go work for CIA, NSA, one of the military, Navy, Army, Air Force, as a janitor at night, um, you have to have a clearance to be in this cleared building. And so they will put you in for a clearance, and there's a lot less people asking to be janitors um, or security guards than there are people asking to be cybersecurity experts. And so I've had students, when I taught um, here in Maryland, we're close to a couple of those big federal agencies because we're close to D.C. And I've had students who, while they were in school, they were working at night being the trash guy for some of these agencies, so they got their clearance. And then when they graduated school, they now had their associate's degree, they had their A+, plus, NET+, plus, Security+, plus, and CCNA, and they were able to get a job with those guys because they had their certifications, they had at least an associate's degree, and they had the clearance, which made these agencies go, yeah, this guy might have a bachelor's, but this guy's got his clearance. I'm taking him. Uh, <laughs> so that is the challenge is how do you, how do you break that mold? And sometimes you got to get a little creative. Uh, and that was one of the more creative ones I saw was people taking jobs as security guards, people taking jobs as um, handymen, uh, janitors, custodial staff. Uh, lunch ladies, um, you know, lunch men, whatever, because uh, there's cafeterias in these big buildings too, right? That serve food, and there are people taking jobs as cooks um, to get in to get in there, right? Because once they got in there, it made it easier to go to the next place. Um, so that's that's one of the things. Um, yeah, it's 
it, it's it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> it is funny, but it is true. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it, it, that is the challenge though is is breaking in. Um, and that brings us to the other thing that people always ask me is, how do I get my first job? Whether it's a clear job or not a clear job. Um, I will tell you, the first job is the hardest, especially if you're trying to go directly into cybersecurity. Because as you're going into cybersecurity, entry-level cybersecurity jobs already assume that you have a couple of years experience. Um, let me see if I can pull this up real quick for you guys. I bet you I can. Give me a second. Sorry, you're going to see me looking at my screen, getting laughed at from across the room. Tippity tap over here. All right. Let's see. I think this is going to work. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good when, when, when the host says he thinks it's going to work. Uh, yes, that's it's working. Okay, awesome. So uh, let me pull this down here so I can get this out of the way. Beautiful. Um, so cyberseek.org. This is this is an awesome, awesome website uh, that you guys should play with, especially if you're here in the U.S. So when you go here, uh, there's two things. You can do the interactive map or the career pathway. The interactive map is pretty helpful because it tells you where the jobs are. So if you look here, this is all based on job postings. And so the darker states have more jobs. California, Texas, Florida, Virginia, DC, Maryland, all very hot cybersecurity areas, right? You can also tell it that you wanna see the supply of workers or the supply to demand ratio. This is what I really like. Supply to demand tells you where is there a lot of people versus a lot of jobs. And so if there's some place that is blue, that would have very uh, a lot of jobs for less people. Where it's red, there are more people, less jobs. So for instance, here in Louisiana, there are four people for every one job, okay? Um, so if we look over here in Virginia, there are two people for every one job. Then that's talking about applications, right? Not the amount of actual people that are getting the jobs. Same thing here in Maryland, 2.2 people per job, California 2.4, right? And if you look, the national average for cybersecurity as a workforce is two and a half. And where are the, the places where you have the, the biggest problem? The DC area. Washington, D.C., 1.8 people for every job there is posted. So that means if you go and apply for a job, you have a 50-50 shot of getting it, right, um, essentially. Uh, Michigan, two. Uh, Massachusetts, two. So pretty much anything in this range is stuff you want to look at, right? Um, the other thing you can do is look at the metro areas. Where are these jobs being posted? And you can kind of see, and you can zoom in onto a particular area if you'd like as well. Um, Used to be able to zoom in. Apparently, I can't zoom in anymore. Um, anyway, trying to do things live, always going to be a problem. Uh, so that's one of the things. Then if you scroll down here, you'll see the top cybersecurity job titles. These are the jobs that people are posting the most that they're looking for. When you see things like engineer, that usually means somebody with about five years or more experience. When you see somebody that's an analyst, excuse me, analyst, usually that's something one to three years experience. Excuse me. Uh, administrator, generally somewhere in that one to three years experience as well. And so you can kind of see vulnerability analyst, penetration tester, and then system administrator. Again, that's one of those feeder roles, right? And if you look down here, you can actually look at what certifications are being requested the most and the least. And so by far, Security Plus, remember I talked about that being entry level? There are five people with Security Plus for every one job asking for it. So a lot of people think, I'm just going to get my Security Plus and that's going to open up the world. Well, there's five people competing for every one job when you have a Security Plus. Now, if you start getting into some of these other certifications like CISSP, there are more jobs, the blue is the jobs, versus the people who are qualified. So you can see here why CISSP is important to get, right? You're under that 1.0 ratio. Again, same thing here as you go down, CISA. Not a lot of uh, people have that certification, only 31,000 people in the U.S., but there's 40,000 jobs available for it. Same thing here with CISM. There are less companies usually that ask for CISM. Look at the number of jobs asked for CISSP is 78,000. The people asking for CISM is 27,000, but there's also a lot less people who have CISM. So that may be one you want to pursue. And so that's why I like this website. You can really start digging into it. The other thing is if you go over here to Career Path and you start going, where am I coming from? Like I said, feeder role, networking is one of those feeder roles, right? Engineering is one of those feeder roles. Software development is one of those feeder roles. 
And if you click to where you want to get to, for instance, you want to be a cybersecurity um, a technician, right? An analyst, essentially, is kind of what we usually call it. The feeder for that is a specialist or a technician. And the feeder for that is usually networking, systems engineering, risk analysis or financial, and security intelligence. Now, why would financial and risk analysis be a feeder into cybersecurity? Well, because a lot of the jobs are at banks because cybersecurity is really important at banks and Wall Street. And so that's why that financial background often transitions over. So that's one of the things I wanted to point out to you guys is this website, you can go play with it. It's called cyberseek.org. Um, it's made by the US government and CompTIA and a couple of other people that work together. They scrape the internet of all the jobs and all the resumes, and they're trying to come up with the best idea of where is the hotspots and where is things um, that we can use to really uh, get benefit out of um, the most people into the right jobs because there is this big skills gap in cybersecurity. So th that is that. So, hey, I'm back full screen. All right, cool. Um, so, yeah, so that is what I wanted to give you, give you guys. And, uh, yeah, so here's uh, another comment we have. Uh, a lot of jobs at the Air Force Base in Las Vegas, they ask for a security clearance. And that's a great way to get your foot in the door is if you can find a way to get that security clearance, right? Um, sometimes you got to be creative, but you think – I always think about the long term, right? Where is it I want to be in five years? I want to be a clear defense contractor, right? I want to be a guy with a security clearance making the big money, you know, um, working for military, U.S. government, whatever. But to do that, I have to have a clearance and I have to have some experience. Well, which one can I attack first in which way? Um, so it may be painful for a year um, to, you know, work work hard as, you know, a, a janitor or even the help desk, right? Because all these places need help desk too. And a lot of times they'll take a chance on a help desk guy um, bringing them in with getting them their security clearance where they won't take a chance on somebody at a higher level. Um, and so you might have to start a little bit back to get there. Um, so it's, it's just different ways of doing things. Always be creative, right? How can you hack the system? That's, that's kind of the yeah. idea. Uh, all right, last question, because we're coming up on an hour here, and i got to go to a lunch meeting. Uh, <laughs> and I need to get dressed, because as you can see, I'm in my formal T-shirt. Uh, <laughs> do you recommend uh, any specific job that wouldn't have on-call? Um, used to work in IT healthcare and hated wake up in the middle of the night for basic things. Yeah, hospital systems are notorious for this, where they have people on call or they do shift work. Um, if you want to avoid on call, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> uh, if you want to avoid on call, there's two basic ways that I that have been really effective for me. Um, one is if you're working for a place that has shift work. So if you do shift work, they usually will break it up into three sections of the day. Usually it's 7 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon, 3 in the afternoon to 11 o'clock at night, and 11 o'clock at night until 7 o'clock in the morning. And those three eight-hour blocks, and they kind of rotate around. If they use shift work like that, uh, if they use shift work, they're not going to have people on call because they have somebody there already 24 hours a day. And the larger hospital chains do that. Um, some of the smaller ones, they might have just a person on call that they can call in when there's an issue. And that's where you get woken up at 3 in the morning. Been there, done that, not so much fun. <laughs> uh, the second way is when you start getting into some of the higher level positions, um, they start pulling away from the on-call because usually it's, hey, the thing's broken. I need somebody to fix the printer in the middle of the night. They're not calling you as the manager to do that. They're calling your people. Um, so, you know, when I was first starting out, my first, you know, four or five years, there was a lot of that on-call work. And then as I progressed upward, there was a lot less of it. Um, the other thing is, if you happen to be the manager, if you put proper systems in place, um, you'll get a lot less phone calls. So one of the networks I used to run was 15,000 people across four countries. It was big. And when I first got there, I would get a call at least twice a week at 2 or 3 in the morning. Something was wrong, and they would wake me up to come fix it. Well, I was the manager. I wasn't the one fixing it. Uh, so I started empowering my people so that they could fix it, and then they could tell me in the morning when I got there what went wrong and what they did about it. And if they couldn't fix it, that's when they would call me. And so my calls went from twice a week to about once every three months. Um, I still got woken up every now and then, and that's okay. That's my job as the big boss, right? But uh, for the majority of things, I was able to avoid that. When you're starting out as one of the, the workers, uh, really the, the way to avoid on call is if you're picking a job that doesn't require it. Um, there are a lot of jobs that don't, especially if your company only works nine to five, they're not going to need to call you in at 3 in the morning because nobody's there to call you. Um, but if you're working with hospitals, they are 24 hours because of the ER, right? The emergency room. Um, and so they do have positions that are, a lot of those positions that are on call. 
Um, those are some of the easier ones to actually get because a lot of people don't want to be on call or don't want to be on shift work. Um, one of the easy ways to break into the industry is if you're willing to be the guy who works from 11 at night till 7 in the morning, most people aren't. Um, and you, you might be able to get a job in that way. And then as you get more senior, they'll move you to the day shift. Because what I've noticed with these shift work things, the 7 to 3 guys, the 7 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon, that's usually the A team. That's the best guys. The guys who have been there for a long time and know what's doing because they have seniority, so they got the better shift. Um, the people who work at night usually are newer uh, or the people that um, don't usually know as much. Or people like me who just happen to like nights. Um, I used to work a lot of overnights. I loved it because it was actually less busy. Um, but that's neither here nor there. That's just that's just my personal experience on that. Um, yeah, and, and usually when you when you're getting a call in the middle of the night, it's I'm locked out. My password's broken. Um, you know the printer's not printing, and you look and it's like missing toner. Right? It, it's usually not hard things. Uh, it could be an interface on the router that needs to be reset. It, it's stuff like that. Um, and a lot of that is you're getting called at from home and it's three in the morning. You're like, oh, again. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that's it's just some of the suggestions I'd have for you. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, getting together today and doing a little bit of live actions. Uh, I, I had a lot of fun talking with you guys and hopefully I answered all your questions. Um, if not, feel free to post them in the group uh, at Dion Training. We're always there. We're always answering your questions. And if I don't have the answer, uh, I know a lot of other students do. Right. So some of the questions like. What are good jobs that don't have on call? If you post that in our group, I bet you some of our other people who already are working in the field can tell you, hey, I have this job. I never get called at 3 in the morning because um, the last time I got called at 3 in the morning was like 2009. Uh, <laughs> so I, I've been out of that world for a little bit, which is nice. Um, but yeah, just um, hopefully that helps. And uh, I'll see you guys again the next time we do one of these. Um, and I hope you guys had a good time. So have a great day.